if you if you have your um, handout from last time, we did not quite finish the the uh, Davidic covenant, a very key covenant in this whole plan of God to exalt His Son. And we did we did begin, but I want to finish. And then today, we when we get to the end of our lesson about the uh, failure of the kingship and the messianic hope, we'll come back to the Davidic covenant as you will see. So it's kind of the lesson today is kind of bookended by thoughts on the Davidic covenant, but it's so critical to understand what's going on in this covenant. And I I misnumbered my my uh, verses that I printed out. So we'll see. Maybe it, it probably is going to be a zoo today. So um, as I try to find things, so bear with me. Um, we did look last time at the covenant proper. The first part, the whole the whole thing is Second Samuel chapter seven. You just have to know that. If you can if you can remember that, you can always run there and and see what's going on in this covenant. Um, it goes. Let's see. From seven, chapter seven, verses eight through twenty nine, and we did look and we asked questions last time about what kinds of things David was promised by God. We noticed the fact that the the whole first part of the chapter, uh, verses eight through seventeen, are 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 full of. The phrase, I will, I will, I will. God is making a promise to David and it's certain and it's unconditional. And he's saying, I'm going to make it happen. And uh, there are similarities to the Abrahamic covenant. Things like making David, giving David a great name. And just the covenant itself ties back in to the promised to Abraham to make him into a great nation. And now this nation has been formed and now the king of the nation is being promised in this covenant to David. God, remember, always meant to have a king ruling over Israel under him, but not the king the people wanted, the king that God wanted. They didn't want a righteous king, right? They wanted a king like all the other nations so they could do their own thing practice their sin, have their idols, have all the things associated with it, but they didn't want a righteous king who's going to enforce God's holy law. They didn't want that. Um, Still true today. People don't like the truth. And so there are many churches out there where they've accumulated teachers that are going to tell them what they want to hear and they can do what they want to do and still, still feel okay with God. That's what the people wanted. No, God gave them a king. David, man after God's own heart. We're going to see how important that is. And then he comes, when he makes that choice, he comes and makes this covenant with David. Um, the key text is verse 16. Among the other things he promises, your house, your lineage, David, your line from, your very, from you, your descendants, your kingdom, shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. We've talked about the fact that when things are consummated in the end, uh, Israel is not just a group of people running around out there. They're, it's a nation that's going to be restored and redeemed. Why? Because of this promise. Because of their king who's coming back to rule over the empire. He's their king. And it's David's throne and house and lineage that are going to endure before him forever. And and we'll see very quickly how that's picked up on in the New Testament. Uh, God's Word stands forever. It can't be compromised. It can't be changed. These promises are certain and sure, just like the ones we have are anchored in these promises and flow out of them. Boy, we, we just have to depend upon God when things get really dark and believe His Word. So that's kind of the summary. And uh, it's not like the one he made with Saul, right? Because of verse 15, he says, um, my loving kindness. What's loving kindness? God's faithfulness. God's faithful, loyal, covenant keeping love. Isn't that a great term? What would be we be without that? We'd be terribly lost. He says, my loving kindness shall not depart from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. 
And then he gives him the great promise. And Nathan gives it to him. So, I wanted you to note, I think this is where we stopped last time. There's a bullet point under number three. Note the father-son relationship between God and the king and compare this to the statement we have in Psalm 2-7. Um, up there in the text, he says, I will, verse 14, I, the, to, the, to his line, to the Davidic line of kings, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. And then he talks about, if any of them commit iniquity, I'm going to deal with them. And we're going to see that in the history of the kingship. But the bottom line is, this father-son relationship is very significant to God. Um, in Psalm 2, we don't have to read the whole psalm, but it's a psalm that has to do with the Davidic king. And every Davidic king, from what I've seen studying, that would come to the throne, this psalm was part of the coronation ceremony. And if you look at it, it talks about the father-son relationship between God and the king. And uh, in verse 7, where the king is responding, speaking back to God, the king says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. Talking about the covenant promise. Uh, he said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And we know, and we're going to see how this is significant for what's coming in Christ. Okay, but it starts here with this father son relationship defined by God in this covenant that is so significant for what's coming as God fulfills this promise. It's just marvelous. And uh, uh, that's the way it was supposed to be for Israel. They were supposed to have kings that functioned that way um, under God. Okay, father son relationship. <laughs> All right, so just keep that in mind. And then the next point, verse per, point four under uh, page six. Um, how does this divinely established covenant relationship and the rest of the and, and these promises made to David fit into God's plan to ultimately exalt his son whom he will send into the world? What you know, we've been tracing these two themes from the beginning. What what are those two themes that we've been tracing now as the big picture unfolds? Uh, relationship, and rule. relationship and rule, both lost by Adam in the garden. He was supposed to rule in God's place, rule under God, reflecting the image of God to the creation as the one under God ruling. But in the context of a love relationship with God in the garden before the fall, that was all true. And then with the fall, the relationship was severed and the rule was severely supplanted. And, and there's the curse and there's the rebellion of the creation against Adam. And even within human relationships, it's just a total mess because of sin. Okay, nothing is the way it's... Why? So God can do this great recovery plan that exalts Christ as the one who recovers what was lost. And this covenant of kingship of course, wouldn't you say, ties into the recovery of rule that Adam lost, okay? One person ruling like that, fulfilling the mandate to mankind, and we, redeemed people, redeemed saints, will rule under him when it's all said and done. That's part of the promises we have as our inheritance. Jesus says, you're going to sit with me and rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's what's one of the promises in Revelation. Hey, it's reflecting what was meant to be for man in terms of God's purpose for man, but it's it's highlighting this man, this one, this purpose. Okay. So the bottom line then is we see this promise, and I love this verse. I'm going to read it because I, I I never get tired of reading it. <clears throat> See what you see here. Let's, and then I'm going to read you a quote by Dr. Craig Blazing on this idea from uh, Luke. When the angel comes to Mary, this is what Mary is told about this son who will be given to her. And behold, this is Gabriel. By the way, that's my grandson's name. Cool. <laughs> Gabriel, who stands in the very presence of God. I was praying for him. May that be true for that little boy one day by the blood of Christ. Stand in the presence of God. 
um, means God is my strength. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great. Great name, David, great name, great ancestor, great son. And, call, and, and will be called, now get this, the Son of the Most High. Now, that term, son, goes back to this covenant. He's going to be a son to me, the Davidic king, and I'm a father to him. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. Who's Jacob? Israel. Forever. And his kingdom will have no end. We're going to talk more about that next time. These great promises that are anticipated in the Old Testament. And then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I am a virgin, the angels answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child conceived in you shall be called the Son of God. Now, let me read you what Dr. Blazing says about this covenant with regard to this idea of sonship. It's really critical. Um, this is from an article that was written, oh, in 2000 that was published in JETS, the uh, Evangelical Theolo Theological Society Journal. He says this, quote, The Davidic lineage is crucial for understanding the New Testament reference to Christ as the Son of God recalling the promise to David in 2 Samuel 7.14. We just read it. Concerning his descendant, whom the Lord would raise up and whose kingdom the Lord would establish. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. In other words, Son of God is first of all a covenantal term designating the fulfillment of the promise to David. Does that make sense? Covenantal term. The remarkable message of the New Testament is that in and through this sonship designed by God to be the king and the son, one of David's descendants, this sonship, through this, a greater sonship is revealed. Right? It's not just a human son of David. We have literal fulfillment with the second person of the Godhead taking to himself the person, the human nature of the son of David. And here's the point he's making. The point is here with regard to this promise, the incarnation is not just the union of God and humanity. It is the incarnation of the son of God in the house of David as the son of covenant promise. Does that make sense to you? There's only one human being that God the Son could unite himself to in this plan and purpose of God, and it has to be in fulfillment of this covenant, the son of David. Okay, Couldn't be from New York. Couldn't be from anywhere else. Couldn't be any other person but this one person. That's critical. From a human standpoint, Jesus is not just a man or generic man. He is that man, that descendant of David, who has a great inheritance and a future set forth in the eschatological fulfillment of God's plan for Israel. Can't separate him from that plan. But as God the Son incarnate, incarnate those promises are ever more sure because it's God the Son who is now united with the Son of David. And they also receive a cosmic addition because of who this person is to the inheritance beyond but not instead of the initial scope of the promise. This, go, this is cosmic when he comes to rule, okay? This person. Paul states in Colossians 1.16 that all things were not only created in him but for him. For him, the Son of God, God the Son incarnate as the covenant Son, the Son of David. If God the Father has given all things to his covenant Son, the Son of David, precisely because he is none other than God the Son, how could Israel's future be any more secure? Does that make sense? Because of who he is. And uh, um, so I wanted to read that to you. 
you can't, you know, when you start talking about the nature of Christ, yes, full humanity and full deity, but most of the great theologies written over the centuries do not deal with his Jewishness. He's just man. Generic man, unite. No, he is one man to fulfill this promise. Are you with me? That's really important. That's what God's doing to fulfill his word to us. Now, oh boy, we can keep going here. <laughs> um, let's see how this idea of the attachment of the son of David, who is united to God the Son, has an impact for Israel. When you look at David's response to this promise, at the end of chapter 17, verses 18 through the end of the chapter, 29, we have David responding to this promise. It's magnificent. Then David the king went in and sat before the Lord, and he said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? Okay. And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord. For you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. This, he, David understands the implications of this for the future. For the sake of your word, verse 21, and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your servant know. By the way, just like the I wills in the preceding section, David uses that term, your servant, just over ten times. His, I'm your servant, I'm your servant. For this reason you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And what one nation on the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for Himself as a people, to make a name for Himself. You remember Exodus? What's it all about? I'm going to set my name on display throughout the whole world when I crush the gods of Egypt and deliver you as my people. I'm your king and your God, but I'm going to show the world who I am. And to do a great thing for you and awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, from nations and their gods. You get it. For you have established your, for yourself your people, Israel, as your own people. How long? Forever. Forever. Wow. And you, O oh Lord, have become their God. That doesn't mean other nations aren't included because the Abrahamic covenant said that. It's through this nation and their king that all the nations are going to be blessed. Praise God for that. Now, therefore... O oh Lord God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, confirm it forever and do as you have spoken. Here's why. That your name may be magnified forever by saying the Lord of hosts is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. I like that. You can pray God's promises back to him that deal with you and your life and your hope. You can pray them to God like David does. Now, O Lord God, you are God and your words are true. You have promised you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with you blessing, and, and, and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. Isn't that great? See, this just isn't a, this is about a nation and a king and a race and a people that affects everybody else, everything else. Okay. I had some questions there for you. Um, we know that this ties into the rule we just talked about it. The kingdom rule forever under Messiah. We'll talk more about that. Um, but I hope you can see the connection. Can you see the connection between this covenant and the nation of Israel? That's why there's still a nation today over there. They're not, they're apostate, but they're a nation. Why? Because of this promise. 
because of what's coming. Okay? I think that's cool. We, we should rejoice in that. When you see them over there fighting for their lives under God's hand, you should go, man, the word of God can never fail. For them, for me, nobody. Okay, Chris did this. Ha! Okay, we're done with that. Let's go to the next lesson. Okay, let's go to the next lesson. Now, here we go. Blast through this one. Where's my little verses for this one? Okay. Well, they're right here. I hope I can figure that out. Um, hang on, i got to grab my little teeny exy. We're going to continue. Well, we did finish the Davidic Covenant discussion. And now we want to review what happens to the kingship and the nation after the institution of this significant covenant. <laughs> okay? It's really neat. The, well, we'll keep... Following the reigns of David and Solomon, the kingship in Israel failed to reflect the ideal of Deuteronomy 17. Remember the text in Deuteronomy 17 where the king was supposed to be humble, represent God, make a copy of the Word of God and keep it with him, study it, live it, humbly reflect it to the people? Well, in general, that, that just didn't happen. Why? Because the kings, but for a few exceptions, as we will see, did not have a heart for God, did they? And they led the nation, along with other leaders, into sin and spiritual adultery. Man, were, if you were in the classes on the minor prophets, my gosh, again and again and again, the same thing. Crummy leadership. Bad-hearted kings. The people, however, except for the righteous remnant, were willing participants. It's not just the kings. Yeah, let's go and let's run into sin, you know, because that's the heart of man. Because they delighted in the pagan worship of the nations around them and had no desire to reflect the holiness of their covenant God. So when their king was a wicked king and he takes them down that path, they're going, let's go. That's what I want to do. Let's establish all those places of temple prostitution and worship because it just gratifies my own fallen desires. So they love to have kings like that. And when the prophets came and started speaking about the holiness of God, what did they do? They hated them. They hated to hear it. Wow. It's setting the stage for a new covenant, isn't it? They need a new covenant. So, this moral failure of kingly leadership, which although to a much lesser extent even plagued the reigns of the righteous kings, including David and Solomon and other, the other righteous kings had their faults. They weren't perfect. And eventually led to the end of the kingship when the nation was exiled from the land of promise because of God's faithfulness to the Mosaic Covenant and jealousy over his great name. He would not let that continue to happen. Right? You're profaning my name. It's done. I promised to do this and I'm going to do it. But he just didn't hammer them immediately. He kept sending them prophets. Repent. Come back to the covenant. Do what you're supposed to do. But they never did. So, when, day, when the Davidic kingship and the nation come to an end under King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the future hope, as we'll see here, of the nation was anchored in the Davidic covenant. And God's ability to fulfill it, no matter how insurmountable the circumstances appeared to be, no matter how dark it got, the righteous clung to this promise and believed God could do it because He said He would do it. Okay? So let's look at some of this history of the kingship a little bit, and then we'll get to the end and see how the Davidic covenant is their hope. Uh, first and Second Kings, you all read it in your Bible reading plan every year, you know, and you see all the ups and downs and the ins and outs and the Stuff, okay. In the history of the kings, J 
Just read through 1st and 2nd Kings, you'll get it all right there. Following the reign of David, it picks up with the death of David and proceeds. Uh, it is a history with a few bright spots, right? As the kings of both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah are evaluated based on their heart for God and obedience to his word, specifically the Mosaic Covenant. And, and, you know, history is not just history in God's hands. It's making a point. It makes a point. And as you read through First and Second Kings, you got to get the point of what's going on and how God interacts with these guys and what he says about them. Okay, so remember that initially this comparison between David and Saul? You know, the king the people wanted, king God wanted to establish. That, that comparison is throughout this history, that kind of comparison. And, and, real, and what happens, David becomes the standard of measure, even in spite of his sin. He wasn't perfect, we'll read that. David's heart for God, walk with God, love for God, was what God wanted from the kings. He becomes the standard. Okay? So let's begin. Let's look. And, and see. How, I want you to see how this is true. Because as you see this throughout the books of kings, God's making a point. God's making a point to them. Um, Solomon started out well, didn't he? A lot of people start out well. But even Solomon did not measure up to the example of his father David as his reign progressed. You can read in 1 Kings 11, Now the Lord was angry with Solomon. Remember, if you go back and read how he built the temple and his prayer of dedication, and oh, it's marvelous. But now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. And, and you remember what turned his heart away? His wives, all the wives. That was the symbol of great kingship if you had all these alliances and all these wives and concubines. And remember in Deuteronomy, it said to the king, do not multiply wives. But he did not observe what the Lord had commanded. So the Lord said to Solomon, because you have done this and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Now get this, though. Here, what's the focus as we go through kings? Nevertheless, I will not do it in your days for the sake of your father David, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, which I have chosen. You're going to see as things move forward, that the, 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 the Davidic covenant promise and the kingship are directly a tie, tied to the capital city of Jerusalem where God has set His name. His name is involved in this with regard to Jerusalem. And we'll see the great promises of restoration for Jerusalem next time. Now, God said, I'm going to give this to your servant. Who's the servant? Jeroboam. In 11, 31 through 36, you know, he's told to take 10 tribes. I'm going to tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and give you 10 tribes. But he will have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen from all the tribes of Israel. It's his city. It's the city of the great king, Jerusalem. It still is the city of the great king. And he's coming back to that city, people. He's coming back. His throne is going to be set in Jerusalem. <coughs> Notice, get the comparison here. Because they have forsaken me. Worship the Asherah. He tells all these 
foolish gods that they're worshiping. They have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances. They're led down this path by Jeroboam, as his father David did. Okay? They have forsaken me. And he's comparing him to David. Nevertheless, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose, who observed my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom from his son's hand. The son, you know, they were led into idolatry. God's going to judge and give it to you, Jeroboam, ten tribes. But to his son I will give one tribe. He keeps repeating this, that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem, the city where I have chosen for myself to put my name. Are you getting it? The focus of God in, these, in this unfolding history of the kings is going to be on David. Can't you see uh, these things, you know, God's value of David's heart in this as he keeps bringing it up? And, and, and it, it, it's David's heart is what the rest of the kings, including Solomon, are compared to. And we'll talk some about this as we get to the end. So ju let's just cover the history and then we'll discuss it a little bit. Now, Kings of the North, just a quick summary. We don't have time. You can go read all the gory details. It's not pretty. It's just not pretty, you know. Jezebel and all the issues. Here's God's assessment of Jeroboam in 1 Kings 14. You know, go say to Jeroboam, thus says the Lord God of Israel, because I exalted you from among the people and made you leader over my people Israel and tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you. Yet you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that which was right in my sight. And he talks about how evil Jeroboam is and what he's going to do. He's going to wipe his family out. Wow. And that characterizes all the kings of the north. There were no righteous kings in, those, in, in that line of kings. So, what happens? What happens? God uses the fierce Assyrian Empire, doesn't he? to judge the northern kingdom of Israel and send them into exile in 722 B.C. It was horrendous, wasn't it? Um, Brian, you shared some of the atrocities of the Assyrians. What a terrible judgment because of their sin. But that's the way it went. Okay, what about the kings of the south? We're up to page three. The southern kingdom of Judah didn't fare much better, but at least God... By God's grace, they had some kings who favorably compared to David, the king after God's own heart. And he, he remains the touchstone of evaluation. And let's just look at a few examples. In the negative sense, Abijam, who came after Re Rehoboam, 1 Kings, it says this, 15, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he committed before him, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father David. <laughs> okay. But for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem. And God promised to this wicked king to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not, this is important, had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. He's not sugarcoating it, but this is how God viewed David's heart. Wasn't perfect, but he's the guy. He's the guy. With respect to his son, Asa, <coughs> 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 whom God raised up, as he promised in verse 4 above, I'm going to raise up a son. We read in 1511, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. Like David his father. Wow. Okay. Sometimes a king would get mixed reviews. Here's one from, from about Amaziah. 
Yet David is still the standard. Second Kings, he did right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David, his father. So there's a plus, but not quite. He doesn't quite measure up. He did according to all that Joash, his father, had done. Same thing said about him. Only the high places, here we go, only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So he did some good things, but not like his father David. And even with Amaziah, the next guy, even though David is not specifically mentioned, he's implied in the context um, uh, with respect to Amaziah's son, Azariah, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. Only the high places were not taken away. So this, it, it's like, okay, he was like his dad. He did right, but not like his father David. That's implied. Not like David. Okay. Hezekiah and Josiah. So, are you getting the idea? Next time you read through the Kings, see how David is the touchstone. See how David is the focus as this history unfolds. Okay? Very important. When a king like Hezekiah meets the standard without qualification, it's really made clear. Listen to this. Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah? What a great... What a Great name for a son. Although, what would his nickname be? Hezzy? Hezzy. <laughs> no, that's not the best thing. Okay. Here's what it says. Here's what it says. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places. See, he went farther than the other guys. Broke down the sacred pillars. Cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it. And it was called Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, <clears throat> so that after him there was none like him among the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. <clears throat> That's a kind of a statement that really tells you he had high value in God's sight. Okay. Why? For he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, let me just say this, though. Hezekiah had his problems. You can read about it. And uh, I put down some thoughts here. You can go to 2 Kings 20, 12 through 19. Remember at the end of his life when the emissaries from Babylon came to, to him? They weren't uh, the power they were going to be yet. But what did he do? He showed them all his wealth. It was like he was kind of bragging. And if you put together uh, 2 Kings 20, 12 through 19 with um, 2 Chronicles 32, 24 through 31, you'll see how there was an issue of pride with Hezekiah. Even this good, godly king had to deal with pride and you know that type of thing and and god god brings that judgment um not in his day but it's coming okay it has his chronicles is a great passage has all his accomplishments but it talks about his pride so you can look those texts up and uh, it, this is important people because when you start talking about this standard it's still not perfect is it it's not perfect it's not perfect but they were good these some of the, the same is true for judah's last good king josiah he did right in the sight of the lord okay he did right in the sight of the lord and walked in all the way of his father david nor did he turn aside to the right and the left page four josiah is great Okay, 2 Kings 22, you can read about his, uh, that's the kind of the, 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 the frame, time frame. Um, and I think I had a quote from, maybe I had that, uh, maybe not. Maybe I lost the last quote, but we'll get to it, we'll get it. Um, when the book of the law was found, you remember, and read to King Josiah, he tore his clothes because he understood the gravity of the nation's sin in its violation of God's law and the divine consequences. 
he states in Second Kings twenty two thirteen, go inquire the Lord for me and the people of uh, and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. <laughs> oh, what a condemnation to people who let the book sit on the shelf. <laughs> it's like this. They found it, you know. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And uh, um, God's response to him is given next. It's really sweet. Um, he said, because they have, you know, because of the sin against me, burned incense to other gods, etc., uh, provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place and it shall not be quenched. They've gone too far. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse. And you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers. You will be gathered to your grave in peace. And your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought back the word to the king. And there's a final evaluation of the king in, uh, let's see, chapter 23. 2 Kings 23, kind of the end of the book of Kings. Let me get there real quick. This is the one I think I messed up. But I wanted to read this to you because it's really, it's really cool. It's all cool, isn't it? What an understatement. 2 Kings 23, 25 through 27. It's at the, it, it, 23, 2 Kings 23 is Josiah's reforms, and he even brought back the Passover. And he, he really did good. Um, but at the end, <clears throat> this is the evaluation. Before him there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses, nor did any like him arise after him. And, but then notice 26 and 27, and that's, that's, that's the heart of David being presented there. However, the Lord did not turn from the fierceness of his great wrath, his anger burned against Judah because of all the sin. And he said, I will remove Judah also from my side as I have done with Israel. And I will cast off Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen, and the temple of which I said my name shall be there. So, he, he, you know, so the, bottom, the next point on your outline then is, hey, <clears throat> the, the righteous kings in the south, they just prolonged the inevitable because they couldn't change the heart of the people. They could bring reform and force conformity to what was right, but does that change the heart? No, they couldn't change the heart. And so the sin was always there, but so it just prolonged the inevitable. Even though they put reform in place, to a greater or lesser extent, they couldn't change the hearts of the people. So Babylon 586, it's over. This brought the kingship to an end but did not annul the unconditional Davidic covenant. God's promise to the shepherd boy who became the king by his sovereign choice would be fulfilled. And this is what's so cool. And we'll see this next time. The Davidic standard of character held high throughout the history of the kings pointed to and would be eclipsed by the coming greater messianic son of David, the king of the eschatological kingdom of God. Who's that? The Lord Jesus, man. Wow. So, I have general discussion. What kinds of lessons? We have a few minutes, and then, you know, maybe we'll pick up Psalm 89 next time as we move into the how this develops in terms of their eschatological hope. What are you laughing at? <laughs> what kinds of lessons can we learn from the successes and failures of the kings of Israel? Let me just ask you this. Why the focus on David throughout the history of the kings? Why? Why, is, why does God do that? Why does He focus on David? 
so much, huh? 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 Well, it, it, he. Okay, that's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, he is the one the promise is made to. Any other thoughts, Don? Um, the Bible states that uh, I read one time that uh, David's the only man in the Bible, but in Christ, uh, that God actually delighted in. I mean, the only man that ever that was ever spoken of. And how does God talk of him? He's a man. What? After his own heart, right. he he right. He he. Lo look at his psalms. Look at the expression of his love for God, and uh, his high value of the Word of God. Um, what else? Why why also would it be important to focus on David? Is David the type of someone else? Remember, type anti type. You have a type. That projects forward to the antitype. Well, the type, the, the type yeah, yeah. When you start talking about this great plan of God and how He's going to exalt His Son, He begins with this covenant to the man who has the heart for God, as much as possible. Still a fallen man who has sin, but He has that kind of heart of God. He's the type of the one who's coming, who will be the ideal. And express the ideal character God's looking for. Okay, so He's the one the covenant's give, given to, and He's the one who, mostly in general, that was ju justification. I heard that. <laughs> I'm excited about that. Maybe it was sanctification. Okay. So <clears throat> He's the type of the King to come. Uh, as pos close as possible, maybe, to the ideal character. And then let me ask you this, then. If that's true, and I think that's true, God's keeping David in the forefront because of the covenant and the one who's going to come. Okay? Isn't that what God's all about? He's about this person that's coming. In God's plan, why the failure of the kingship? Why the failure what is the failure of this kingship setting up? Yes, yes. Even the best of them had their problems. And when the whole kingship falls apart and God judges the nation, it's just setting the stage for what's coming, isn't it? You need a greater king than these guys. You need someone that's better than them. And we're going to see next time, we're going to talk about the eschatological hope that develops from, you know, you can see it initially in Psalm 89, which we will cover very quickly next time. He wants by comparison to appreciate what yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, it didn't work because of sin. But the promise, how can you have a lineage and a throne and a kingdom forever? You better have a king who has that kind of character that can't fall. Is that why um, God chose well, the people chose Saul, and God let them have Saul. Well, it, it was there's a there's a, like we talked about that last time. I, I mean, wasn't here last week, I'm sorry. <gasps> okay. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, and yeah. But anyway, I'm saying okay. Tied to what you're saying, the contrast of having a king first who wasn't yes part, yes. Yes. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair, Cindy, because there is that comparison with David and Saul, and it has to do with the heart. It has to do with the heart. So this, this, this is. If we had David first, yeah. 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 That's important because God may Joel. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. 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 Where is the truth? Very good. Very good. I think that's fair. And then go ahead. The lampstand? No. I'm sorry.
torn apart the kingdom from Solomon. Yeah. It says that my, uh, and he's going to let Rehoboam have one of the tribes. Yeah. And then to his son, I will give one tribe that my servant David may have a lamp always before me in, in yeah. Jerusalem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about during the exile? How do we consider? Yeah, I, I think lamp? I think that when you start talking about, he's God's making a point that this covenant with David. I'm going to honor, but there's a there's a limit with regard to their sin, okay? But the lamp in Jerusalem ultimately is the line continues, but the kingship does not, because Zerubbabel's in the line of David, post exile, okay? And we see how God keeps that line going, but not the not the throne, okay? Um, because of their sin, which again is setting the stage for the one who can come and establish the throne in righteousness. And we'll talk about some of those texts next time. One final question, and then I'll let you go. Personally, <clears throat> what does God require of us? You and me. What does God require of us? Sure. What else? Yeah. He wants from you the same kind of heart David had, doesn't he? He wants that kind of heart from us. You love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And David, even though he messed up, was God's stamp of approval on that kind of heart. And none of us are perfect. But in general, people today, because of the new covenant, have that kind of heart. And that's what God's looking for doesn't matter whether you're King David or me or you. That's the kind of heart he longs to see uh, his people living out, right? Isn't that fair? Be like David with Goliath, not like with the other part. You know, run into battle and do battle trusting in God. And one final thought. Well, we'll get there next time.